Thank you. Thanks for, for coming along to our panel on force for good and sustainability and um, the, the massive impact that we're seeing from this year's events um, on the world stage. I'm delighted to welcome you to a panel that has um, three sets of very interesting people with, in different walks of life who tackle the whole topic of climate, sustainability, the development goals, um, and are here to share their thoughts and experiences with you. Uh, the first we have is Chantaline Carpentier from, from the UN. I'm also delighted to have Marina and Raman. Marina is from Schroders and Raman is from Great West Life. Uh, we'll bring three perspectives to you uh, from, from this panel. The first is the United Nations, and uh, Chanteline will add her thoughts to, um, to us on how, how does the UN see the world in terms of sustainability and our chances of, of achieving the sustainable development goals. And then Marina is somebody who is a chief sustainability officer operating in North America with a lot of experience in finance just before that part of her career too, but also interacting with clients who have quite wide views actually on sustainability and its importance in the Americas. Uh, and so we'll share some of those thoughts too. And Raman, uh, from his position as the Chief Investment Officer at Great West, Great West Life, will share the perspective of capital allocation and strategy for that too. Let me begin with a very brief introduction uh, on what Force for Good is and some of the key findings of this year's report that was released just, um, just, la just la late last week. So capital is a force for good is our report, and force for good is an institution that looks at the mobilization of capital across the world towards the themes that will allow us as a world to get um, sustainable development uh, to embed in, in the world all across and to achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals. This year's report is quite an alarming one in some ways because it points to how much money is needed, how much capital is needed to flow to actually achieve the, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. There's something like $450 trillion of gross liquid assets in the world. And our estimations are that the, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, to level up the world, if you like, and to bring people into inclusion, would need something like $175 trillion. That's something like 25% up based on our calculations last year. But the gap in terms of funding gap for the Sustainable Development Goals is uh, about $135 trillion. And that's 35% up from last year. These numbers are driven by the inflation in the world, not funding the goals over many years. And we have something like seven and a half years to go before the, the plan should be done and people should be funded and we should have leveled up the world. So this is an ambitious task. With that, that amount of money to move, so approximately 175 trillion out of 450, there'd have to be such a big shift, of course, in how capital works and gets allocated. Um, I'll, I'll encourage us, given you know, in the audience, of course, we have lots of people who are investors, to think about some of the challenges that come with the sustainable development goals, but the opportunity side more than the challenges in some ways. So you know, what is it really about? And, and one, one view is that it's about the fact that sustainability is a cause that needs to be funded because there are people who are poor, underprivileged, excluded, and that's the reason why we have the standard development goals. I'm paraphrasing, of course. Uh, I'll suggest that there is an, another good reason, a very good reason also, to fund the sustainable development goals. Something like two thirds of the world is not included in the financial system of the world formally. They either don't have a bank account or they have a bank account that is barely used. That population also doesn't have financial inclusion, but also educational inclusion, digital inclusion. But it's a, it's a massive population mainly in the global south, but it also exists within countries too, of course. And that population is migrating in large numbers to other parts of the world. And it, of course, for economic opportunity, but also because of the conflicts they face. This large base, two thirds of the world, and it's, it's astonishing that it's that big, is of course a, a base that is a potential customer base. And today's technology allows that customer base to be accessed and to be served within countries if they're, if they're excluded, but also across the globe. So as the next decade is, is consumed by, by technology and advances in technology, that customer base is, a, is actually a valuable customer base that can be served for almost everything. And they are consumers and their countries will end up with prosperity. 
And so the sustainable development goals are potentially a massive opportunity as the cost of technology comes down to serve the customer base that has not been served within countries and across borders. And, and I'll stop there and, and then throw this question open to the panel. And what I'm going to do is, is begin with, um, with Raman giving us a perspective. Raman, you have a job as the chief investment officer. So, I mean, that's an interesting position in terms of the strategy for capital allocation. How, how do you see that, Raman, in terms of sustainability and capital allocation from, from your position? Thanks, Kitan, and, and happy to be here. Um, so, yes, our company is a, an insurance company, uh, but we offer services not just in insurance, but in asset management and retirement. And um, it's also a very old company. So I tell people, you know, one of, some of our operating segments, for example, in Canada, we, under, we operate under the Canada Life brand. It's a company that's 175 years old. It's actually older than the, um, the country itself. So I think the way I describe it is sustainability is, is really at the heart of, of what we do. It always has been. You don't, you don't survive through multiple pandemics and wars without thinking about allocating capital in a sustainable manner to meet the demands of our clients. And I, and I think the point you raised, Kitan, on the opportunity is a good one because our clients, <clears throat> we're providing services and, and trying to do good in the areas of insurance, in the areas of um, wealth management, financial planning, um, helping people in events such as disability. We've largely served European and, and North American clients. So when I think about the opportunity that exists, I, I see it really in, in, in two ways. Um, one is, the ability to expand, as you were saying, our, our client base, our reach, um, to serve some of the two thirds of the population that, it, that isn't being served appropriately today. Um, <clears throat> and then the other is, and we'll get into this maybe as the panel goes on, but learnings from uh, ways to allocate capital to make it not just about doing good, but actually um, being able to earn a appropriate amount of return on that capital while you're doing good. And um, the good news is we've seen examples in uh, different regions that, that work. We've seen examples where the private sector can partner with the public sector um, in order to uh, fund projects which do good in the world, uh, but also provide a, a benefit to the private capital and appropriate rate of return. And, and I think the only way that the numbers you're, you're talking about um, are, are closed, the gaps are closed, I don't think private sector can do it on our own. I don't think the government sector or the, or the public sector can do it on its own. It's, it's got to be a joint collaboration. So we've had some success, um, in, particularly in Canada or North America, in funding some of these projects. And I think there's learnings that can be used to, uh, to expand it. So it's a uh, short story is it's, it's something we think about all the time. Marina, would you also give your reflections and a, and a brief introduction, which I should have asked Ron to do, but he did. Sure. So, please. Um, something of a similar story. So um, Schroeder's is almost a trillion dollar asset manager. We are global, but we're domiciled at our headquarters in the UK. Um, and we're also 200, well, 217 years old. Um, and, and I would say the same thing. You know, when we think about sustainability, um, we think about just sort of prudent investing. Um, we have to take into account the um, the investment risk, the operational risk, the reputational risk for a business. Um, so it's something that we've been focused on for a long time. For 20 some years, we've had dedicated resources. And, you know, we have the entire spectrum of product from sort of ESG integrated strategies to sustainable strategies to indeed impact strategies through our Blue Orchard brand. Um, what I would say is I think it's really important to make distinctions about sort of the differences between those things. I think the industry has not always done a very good job, which has allowed folks to kind of lump everything together. And so somebody can say, well, I don't want ESG, right? Well, what, what is it that you don't want, right? Which component? Is it sort of risk management that you're not looking for? Or, you know, are you not looking to focus on a particular cause? Because that's a reasonable thing to say. Everybody should have the opportunity to align sort of their values to their investing. Um, I think the, the pieces that I took away from the, the report, right, um, which came out last week, um, is, is the same sort of mindset that we have to frame this, especially in the U.S., kind of in North America, where I'm responsible for, we have to frame these things as opportunities um, rather than, you know, just risks or, or causes. Um, everyone has different causes, but investors are looking for opportunities. And so there are kind of real examples of this. Um, we also have to, I think, look beyond climate or just be conscious of the way that kind of climate interplays with social factors, um, people factors. So a lot of the things that you talked about in the report, you know, mass education, um, housing, certainly financial inclusion, which we also do a lot of through the Blue Orchard brand, uh, we focus on financial inclusion. Those are real opportunities to unlock potential kind of populations, right? Um, and yeah, to make profit. 
Um, so I think there's that piece of it. The other piece we, we focus on now is sort of uh, natural capital, um, which obviously interplays beautifully with sort of climate and people. Um, and again, there's real money to be made. Um, half of the global GDP depends on nature. Uh, we're not valuing nature properly. Um, and then as we kind of think about climate mitigation, about a third of the solution ultimately comes from sort of nat nature and the ability to capture carbon. Um, so there's a real investment case as companies make um, commitments, right, to sort of net zero into the future. The demand for carbon credits, right, for the carbon offset markets, um, you know, will grow in exponential ways. And as I like to say, uh, from Mark Twain by way of the Sopranos, you know, God's not making any more land, right? So the, the resources are there. And I think that for investors, it's a 20, 30 year view kind of opportunity. And that's the kind of thing we need to talk to investors about so they understand that there is this sort of nexus, right, of doing the right things, uh, but also finding kind of the profit motive. Um, and again, as investors, as an asset manager, that has to be the primary thing that we focus on uh, because we are fiduciaries of our client assets. Marina. Thank you, Marina. It's very interesting. There's, there's a lot in that that I'm going to unpack in a moment too. Uh, Chanteline, you've been a sponsor from the start and uh, one of the reasons why we ended up launching Force for Good. Um, but the sustainable development goals is something you've been involved in for a very long time, from, from inception. How do, how do you see the investment thesis of it and, um, and what, what do you think we need to do to make sure they are achieved? Well, thank you, Ketan. It's a pleasure to be here with uh, my co-panelist and you. Um, I had the privilege actually to be um, in a different position when the sustainable development goals were negotiated and be part of the negotiation from the non-state actors. That means NGOs and private sector and local authorities and all the other non-governmental entities. Um, and so I do believe, uh, and I've never seen so much pickup. And actually when we brought them, the idea was the mandate came out of Rio and we never seen that much private sector participation at anything the UN organized before. There was an interest because of what both Roman and Marina mentioned, the opportunities. And I'd like to maybe focus on this, but first let me just mention, I'm now the chief of the UN Conference on Trade and Development. And the reason this is dear to our heart is for two reasons. One, um, we it, it's, it's equity and poverty uh, alleviation, and that only can be done by allocating capital towards these SDGs. And UNCTAD was the first organization to actually estimate in 2014, while well, we finished the negotiation before it was brought to the GA, uh, the cost of achieving the SDGs at $2.5 trillion for developing countries alone per year. But we also estimated at the time that that may have met investment opportunities of 40 to 50 billion in the energy sector alone for the private sector, of 30 to 40 billion a year on telecom, and, and not on infrastructure and another 40 to 80 in telecom. So there, there are, these were the areas where, of course, it was more obvious for the private sector. But now we're seeing a great push on energy. Uh, we have the net zero banking alliance. We have the net zero insurance alliance coming out, if it's not already. Uh, and, and so every single area is now it's having its net zero. And what we're seeing for those is that the, Greenhouse emissions have to be reduced by half by 2030. So while a lot, all of these, there's actually hundreds of, of governments, private sector investors that have actually made commitment to um, net zero by 2050. But to get there, that means that there are short-term targets that need to be issued. Now, the energy sector represents 73% of greenhouse gases. The agricultural sector, about 16 to 29%. And you've mentioned of the areas on, on, on nature-based solution. A lot of it will be around agriculture and forestry. And what we haven't done yet is sit down and look at the opportunities within the, 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 these companies. It's starting. The leaders in the industries are starting to do that. And they're finding these gold nuggets of when you stack the environmental and the social issues together. So you create income for low-income women uh, in rural areas. Uh, you also uh, create uh, access to banking for, and then empower them to have rural development. And then these become clients for the future because you've developed that. So we see a big opportunities and the SDGs are increasingly being used by all stakeholders as an overarching framework. And that's something that everybody can talk to and have with the common language, which we didn't have before 2015. So they're powerful. And I'll conclude with this. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, um, with the COVID-19, we pretty much 
lost all gain we had made on the on the SDGs and all of them in developing countries. All the investment flow to developing countries aligned with the SDGs, which we document in, at UNCTAD with the investment trends uh, monitor on the SDGs has been lost. We recuperate some of those loss, a 70% increase in SDG aligned investment in, uh, in 2021. And then we pretty much uh, been stagnating or losing them since the war in Ukraine. And now we're facing a global crisis, which is a cost of living crisis, where we just risk to have with the food, food fuel and finance crisis, we risk having a lot of state going failed state where we will not be able to have business and where we will not have a stable world. So we, that's what preoccupies us um, at the UN now. It's a big agenda. It's a really <laughs> big agenda. And we finished 2021 and COP26 seemed to occupy so much space uh, in the news flow. Uh, and there was some optimism. I mean, there were always people saying not, not enough was achieved in COP26, but there was a huge amount of optimism saying the world will now start to rapidly tame the, the, the emissions and methane. There was an agreement on deforestation to stop that. There was an agreement on coal use. And so it seemed like it was moving forward. But then we have in 2022, just in the first six months, we have a war in Ukraine. We have food supply chains broken, uh, given how much of a food basket Ukraine and Russia were. Supply chains seem to be still broken and even more so. Um, and then you have people going into poverty and the displacement of people uh, from various conflicts and climate change issues, wildfires across Europe and so on, seems to be enormous enough that 270 million people are counted as migrants today. And the expectation is that that will be a billion people by 2050 out of a population of 10 billion. So stability is rocked. And the study analyzes and says that you need about $60 million to be spent, $60 trillion to be spent to 2030 to, to just for security, military security, economic security, uh, energy security, and so on. And so this is quite a big spend. I, 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 you know, so there are, there are lots of reasons why people would be thinking, I need to focus on my short term, not on the longer term sustainability. Marina, you touched on the sort of challenges you hear and there is a lashback in the US against ESG. Um, you say sometimes it's confused, but there is this pushback. Yeah. How, how do you see it and what are people saying to you? And are you sympathetic <laughs> to the fact they're concerned? Uh, of course. I mean, I think empathy and respect is sort of the bedrock of, you know, engaging with other people. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is a, an important moment for our industry, by which I mean the sort of sustainability of space, I guess, as a whole, um, to have some measure of self-reflection. Because as you say, there was a, a period that came, let's say before the pandemic, uh, five to six years uh, where sustainability correlated really beautifully with the things that were doing very well. So large cap growth over small, you know, US over international and emerging markets, growth over value. Um, and it's easy to be very sort of self-confident in that environment. Uh, very few questions get asked. Um, and, you know, you can build up some hubris. I think, um, and believe yourself to just generally be right, even though it's really the circumstances around you. So um, I think we probably did not do enough over that time as an industry um, to make inroads with, with folks um, and to make sure that they understood that we respected their priorities too. I mean, we talk a lot about obviously the SDGs and um, you know folks in the global South and emerging markets, but they're obviously very underserved or very uh, vulnerable communities in developed markets as well. Um, and those people feel that very keenly, right? They're kind of overlooked because they live in a rich country. And so people overlook their, their situation. And it's obviously not just directly kind of workers and communities that are dependent on fossil fuels, for example, in the US, but it's sort of larger, right? Because, uh, you know, you have whole towns. Um, so it's not just the people employed um, by those businesses. And so the concept of just transition or the discussion of sort of, it isn't, it's not meant to be an excuse to not move down the path but it is meant to be an excuse, or not excuse, but, but sort of a way to move down the path more pragmatically. Um, and so I do think that we have a lot of work to do now that, it, you know, as you say, like we had a very good period and then you, what you find is it, it, it wasn't, we weren't able to, given all the, the pandemic and, and now, you know, with the, the war in the Ukraine and Russia, um, it, it, you know, it destabilized the situation and, and so you don't have that continuity. Um, and so now you have to rebuild 
you have to have a more mature and more measured sort of conversation about what these things mean, what these investments look like for the very long term, because they are very long term investments. And again, that kind of focus on, you know, creating that that view of that it's opportunity um, and finding commonality. Like I said, I think climate, you know, today in the U.S. is a, is a pretty fraught topic, but there are other areas, social certainly governance, um, as I said, around nature, I think that you can find common ground with people. And that's where you have to begin, I think, to rebuild those relationships. Thank you, Irina. Um, Raman, what, what, are the, what are the challenges? One of the things, as you know, um, and Great West Life is, uh, and Schroders are both part of the data set that, uh, of companies we look at and are active participants in Force for Good. And we find there is a, a, a very strong correlation between people doing more in sustainability and being more profitable. In fact, those that do the most, the upper quartile of companies we looked at, uh, out of 120 of the largest financial institutions in the world representing you know, half the world's money, the, the, the upper quartile outperformed the rest uh, on shareholder returns, 5x, 6x, mm -hmm. over a five-year period. So, you know, so it's, that's a substantial, it could be out by a big factor, and that's still a very substantial, significant outperformance. Yet there are challenges. So yeah. how, how do you see the, the challenges and the performance drivers? Well, actually, I'll pick up on a thread that Marina just raised with respect to the, some of the pushback that we're, we're seeing as an industry. I, I think has to do with one of the challenges, which is, which is measurement. So I think, you know, as we dive into this, and, and um, Chantelaine, we have also made a, a net zero commitment for, the, for our insurance balance sheet. But it's interesting when you dive into the details <laughs> of how do you actually measure this and then how do you um, progress it, you know, over the coming one, three, five, ten years on the march to um, a net zero path by 2050. It becomes complex very, very quickly. So that some of the challenges are there is not a standardized, consistent measure um, across the industry in terms of how we uh, compute the the greenhouse gas emissions for a large portion of the invested assets that we do. So, you know, we're relying on assumptions and proxies, which is fine, but it can um, lead to questions on comparability and and, and efficacy. Um, the other uh, issue we find is regulation. So it's getting better, but you know we operate like many companies in, in multiple jurisdictions and we have multiple regulators and the regulations are not necessarily, and the reporting requirements are not necessarily consistent. So um, it becomes quite challenging and it becomes quite costly. So for a large organization, perhaps you can, you can manage this uh, as, as a part of your overall business. But as a smaller organization, I think it becomes a challenge um, to, to make it practical uh, to meet these uh, to meet these goals. So, um, as we progress in, I think one of the important things we have to continue to progress is is the data and and how are we going to properly measure it? What's going to be a consistent reporting standard? Um, I think the idea coming out of the accounting um, the IFRS Accounting Foundation is to have um, consistent. Uh, accounting and reporting requirements across, uh, across multiple geographies, that's a very good um, first step. And I think um, once we can address the data challenges, I think it'll be easier to have consistent reporting. Um, so that, that's one big challenge. The, the other one I'll call out, and there are a few, um, there's, there's opportunities too, we can talk about those. But the, um, the other big challenge is time horizon. You know, as much as we are, are talking about these goals, um, the reality is there is no short-term magic bullet. So we are a carbon-based economy. It's going to take time. For example, in our organization, we've been um, really hesitant to exclude a certain industry um, from our investment policy because uh, we think it's actually more effective to, to engage with them. So rather than say we're not going to invest in a particular, say, oil and gas company, because they're a high carbon producer, well, no, yeah, but that's where the opportunity is. The opportunity is actually to invest in them, to engage with them, um, and then track it, and again, in a consistent, measurable fashion, and that's really how you make progress. So there's just, there's just so much work to be done in this area, and the clock is, and the clock is ticking. Robin, that's a big change management project, right? Because you have a portfolio that was embedded in an industrial model, you know, fueled through fossil fuels. Uh, and you're part of the transition of that to something else, which might be more efficient, might make higher returns, uh, and might give you know your your stakeholders uh, a better world to live in. Um, now that's a big transition, Chantelaine. We pick that up, and yeah. how do you see that transition? Because it's a difficult one. Right, everyone is vested in a world that had oil and gas, and was built on oil and gas, and all the prosperity was built on oil and gas. Now we, we, we feel we have an existential threat, which you know, 
the vast majority of the world's scientists have, have fully aligned on, and this transition is happening, but it's still very challenging. How do you see that? I think we will have a transition, and I think it's upon us to make sure it's a just transition. Um, and it could be a messy transition, or it could be an organized one where we, you know, most people benefit and we actually uh, have less stranded asset. And to do that, and I'll pick back up where women and Marina left it, um, I think we need to, and also to address the ESG question and the backlash. What we've not been good at is measuring the positive externalities for the investment in sustainability. I'll give you a specific example. Arling Fisher, right, trying to, they're trying to do good for the environment. So they basically pick back up your clothes and then they, whatever is still good, they make new clothes out of it. And they invested in that, but they never went back to the finance, uh, the, the CFO for, for this. It was a sustainable, uh, um, 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 category. It was not a venture one. And yet what they found is that the one thing that their marketing side was trying to do is trying to get the younger generation as client. Um, now they would get that as a positive externality of the investment on the E. And so this, we need to document those. There's several examples of those that we've not documented. Once we document them, it's so much easier to then see where the opportunities are and do that just transition, but also a smart and organized one. So that's on the positive measurement. And I think for that, we're going to need a lot of pre-competition uh, cooperation at the sector level, because all of the gas and oil company in Canada face the same constraint of reducing, you know. And so there is an, an, I, there is an there's, there's a need, actually, to maybe jointly invest in carbon and capture in jointly invest in some of uh, uh, models of, mm -hmm. of reducing flaring, for instance, uh, emissions. So that's on the, one, on the one hand. On the second point, just transition, I think as we learn in the US and in Canada, which is easier because a lot of you have mandate to invest in your own country and it's easier because you know better. We then need to apply that to developing countries. I mentioned very little of this capital is getting to developing countries. And yet, uh, there is, as we're going to do this in energy transition and agriculture transition, developing countries have huge competitive advantage over our country. And I'll give you one example. Right now in Africa, they can produce uh, uh, green hydrogen at the same cost than um, gray hydrogen in Europe. And so there is an, an, an incentive to invest in Africa and get a way to do that. But for that, we're all going to have to learn. I feel comfortable talking to IFIs and NGOs. Maybe Marina and Raman, you do too, but a lot of people in the industry don't. We need to start to, to learn how to work together, to cooperate, and to learn from each other so that we can achieve um, these transition in a way that is, um, is going to be smooth. Marina. Yeah, and if I may, I think one one very positive thing, right, um, is that society has changed. And we're talking about the young consumers. People have changed. What we expect of companies, um, there is no kind of putting that genie back in the bottle. Um, so there's been a lot of disruption in recent years, but the trajectory is still such that I think we've, you know, historically in asset management thought about kind of return and risk. And now we think about impact. And I mean here the lowercase i impact, but just basically... As, as you know, uh, as we said, I kind of interact a lot with clients, and the average client does want to know what the impact of their investments is. They, they're not putting blinders on. They don't want this to be in a vacuum. They want to understand, at the very least, they're not doing damage. And the next step from that is, you know, can I also be doing some good? There has to be that financial return component that's critical because everybody does think about their own bottom line. Uh, but I think the mindset um, and the measurement of kind of both positive and negative externalities, right, to understand, again, the impact of investments, um, holding companies to account on those, um, again, sort of, you know, consumers, um, society, regulators, policymakers, I think that alignment is something that is very positive. And that particular trend, I think, will, will persist despite the sort of recent year's disruptions. Interesting. As, as, we, uh, as, as we look at the, the third part of this dialogue, which is, what is the opportunity? Um, and how do you see the outlook? Um, it, it seems as if the, the, the case for, for investing in solving complex problems has always been there. So the, the businesses that were good at solving complex problems were superior organizations in their sectors because they dealt with this complexity and they built the risk management models, the opportunity models, the execution models. And what, what we saw in the report was uh, out of 120 financial institutions, 
there are a small set, 20 let's say, that are dealing with the most complex issues in the world. And they're dealing with them because they think it's commercial to do so. And they're learning these huge numbers of skills, therefore, solving these, these problems, whether it's you know, finding a customer base in Africa or, or finding an underprivileged um, group within their own countries that they figure out how to make into commercial customers. Sure. But by dealing with that at scale, they, they've got smarter. And that translates into returns. So you would have thought yeah. the case is there yeah. to profitably solve the world's problems. Is that actually, is that actually what you're seeing, Ram? Yeah, so I think that's. I think everyone's touched on this, and this is maybe the the, the crucial point. Um, I mean, the, the the genesis, the way we think about it, in order to share value, we have to be able to create value. So, how do you create value? And I think you hit on it just now, Kevin. Is there is value in this complexity? So, we've been investing, as an example. So, I'll put on my chief investment officer hat and and, and tell you, as we've been investing for decades in renewable financing on solar and wind and hydro projects in Canada in joint partnerships with the government. And we, we weren't doing it, quite frankly, because we had a, um, a goal of net zero in, in the economy. We were doing it because within that complexity, you know, these are private investments, they're, you know, they're tougher to negotiate, they're, um, they're more complex, they're longer term, they're less liquid. Um, all of this means they, we accrue a higher return uh, for our stakeholders by investing in this particular project versus another one. Um, and it's been remarkably successful for everyone involved, you know, in terms of developing the infrastructure, getting more capital into the ground much quicker, a better return for stakeholders by, by attacking that complexity and solving it. So, so that's something where, you know, you think about all the infrastructure, all the technology that needs to be developed, not just in the developed world, but obviously in the, the developing world, it's a huge opportunity for private capital, um, but, but it's complicated. And, and how do you do that in a country where you're not domiciled, um, where you may not have you know, boots on the ground? Um, it, it's a much more uh, complicated problem to solve when you move outside your own region, but the framework is there. And I guess that's the, the good news for me, being an optimist. You know, I can see it. We've done it for a number of years. You can see it happening with the infrastructure bill in the U.S., you can see a pathway, um, and then it's, you know, can it be replicated in, in other areas? And I think um, given the amount of attention and the amount of um, force behind this, um, I think it can. So, so that's, I think, a, a, a huge, I mean, the numbers you were, you were talking about, Sean, are massive in terms of the amount of capital yeah. and the amount of opportunity that can flow to this. So I think that's a, um, an encouraging sign. Marina, would you touch on that too? I mean, you, you've had so many different roles inside mm. the bank and other banks too. Yeah. But, um, you know, as an investment professional, you see opportunities coming all the time. And this is another set of investment opportunities. Yeah. Um, how do you see that in I terms mean, of the outlook? Absolutely. I would say that that lens, that perspective, because obviously for the most part of our business, we're looking at kind of investee companies and how they're solving for these challenges. So, you know, we have a long running kind of global sustainable growth strategy that looks for just that. I mean, who are the companies that are proliferating uh, you know, bank accounts across sub-Saharan Africa or communications, right? Um, all of those sorts of connectivities that create, um, uh, you know, like leverage um, and growth. Um, and then on the climate side, I think we're very uh, sort of focused on finding leadership in the industry, right? So in every in every space, there are going to be companies that have sort of seen the future clearly and they're leaders. They may need, as we I think touched on, transition financing, right? They may not be able to kind of get there without the support of shareholders. So if you do say, I'm divesting, I look at you now and you're clearly not, you know, you're problematic and so I'm going to take my money away. Um, I mean, some, first of all, somebody else is going to buy it. So you're not really making any change. Uh, but the, the end result is you, know, you have to you have to be there. You have to be engaged. You have to understand the path going forward. And so kind of climate leadership is another sort of focus or lens for us. Um, how do we help companies get to that future? We also think about um, the concept of avoided emissions. Everybody's very focused on scope one through three. Uh, but if you are making investment over time in technologies or processes that can avoid kind of further emissions in the future, you want to be able to give companies credit today um, for you know those plans um, so they can execute on those plans. So I think we're looking for both kind of the evolvers over time because that is where you unlock value, not like sort of who looks good today, but who can look good in the future. Um, and then also enablers, you know, who's who's kind of building the technology that can enable others to succeed. Hmm. So yes, on a kind of a day-to-day, -day, on the ground, investment perspective, those are very much the sort of lenses through which we're looking. Interesting. Shanti, would you pick that up too in the sense that, um, uh, step back for us. So we're seven and a half years in. Mm -hmm. Every country in the world signed up to the Sustainable Development Goals and we are failing to achieve them at the pace at the pace that we should have 
but at the level of investment that we should have too, right? So uh, we have seven and a half years to go. Um, what is the outlook? Are we going to make it? And if we, <laughs> what do we have to do to make sure we are going to make it, do you think? So I think first, um, and I think Roman mentioned that, um, we all need to do our part. So every single industry and in 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 sector needs to do their part. Um, there's a few silver lining that I see. One is, um, you know, there's a huge push now at WTO and elsewhere of repurposing the $640 billion a year in, in, in fossil fuel subsidies and $440 billion in subsidies to pretty intensive agriculture that if repurposed towards sustainable agriculture and renewable energy would actually provide some of the funding from the government side, guarantees and others and, and infrastructure needed for you to come in with the investment that makes it, you know, risk, return, impact uh, compatible. So that's one good news. The second good news, I think, is in the past, what we've heard is, and we've heard that um, board would be not they're, they're, they are aging. Board are, <laughs> are not changed very quickly and, and they're not been, uh, as attuned to some of these upcoming opportunities. And sometimes there's been a break on some of these more innovative approach. And we're seeing now that it's changing. A lot of people are talking about getting you on their board, um, getting younger people, more diversification of the board members, which we believe would help. There's also a lot of crackdown on greenwashing, um, as you saw. So there will be people will be more careful. And we actually did notice that in our, our world investment report this year, we do document how many we have last year to 5.2 trillion in 2021 in funds associated with either social SDGs or, or, or green bonds. Uh, and it's actually went down a little bit because of the crackdown on, on uh, greenwashing. And therefore, I think now the industry is kind of relooking and then we're going to come back. So there, there are opportunity, but we're going to have, I'll give you a quick example. I was just at this meeting with, um, and I don't want to be promoting anybody, but it was uh, Bloomberg Philanthropy and City Foundation, I think. And they've, they basically work with they brought 500,000, um, uh, no, 500 million women in Tanzania and Rwanda, literally that didn't have the capacity. They trained them uh, on co in coffee, high quality coffee, and several other sectors uh, that then others can invest in. And now these women are literally tracking the stock exchange in New York to sell their own product themselves, high return, investing in their own community, sending their kid to school. So we need to learn to actually work with all the stakeholders. There will be need for philanthropies and for international financial organization, regional banks. Um, and we haven't, we don't teach that in business school. So we're actually pushing and also to change the curriculum in business school. Interesting. That's interesting. I was going to pull, I think the education is a, is a huge part of it. Uh, and, and in, as we go into the wrap up of this, really, um, there is a temptation to think, there's somebody poor and dying in some other part of the world and we have problems at home, why should we help them? And it's not that why should we, but how we got the money to really help them. People understand it empathetically. Um, if, I, if I take off the force for good hat and put on the investing hat as the CEO of an investment firm called Greater Pacific Capital, the most exciting opportunities for us are when someone comes along and says, we have an edutech solution that could educate you know, hundreds of millions of people and we'd like to roll it out and we'd like you to invest a few hundred million dollars to help us do that. And it's quite exciting. And when someone comes along and says, I have a fintech solution and it plays to a natural advantage, which um, women have over men, which is that if you give a dollar to a woman in a poor country, she will actually give it back. But the man will probably drink it. Right. So, you know, you don't want to give it to the man. You give it to the woman and your default rates are almost nothing. And it's very profitable to do that. And so, you know, those businesses are quite exciting. A lot of the businesses of the people on the stage, um, th those that are in business, are, are natural products that are do-good products. Insurance is a natural do-good product. Mortgages are a national, natural do-good product. Um, you know, and investments into things like new technologies, educational, financial, and so on are actually natural do good investment strategies and products. And uh, it's, it's just, can we configure it differently to do so? Um, I'd like you to give us your last thoughts as we go through um, and then we'll wrap up. Why don't we start uh, with Shorter Link? Um, I guess quickly, I think we need, as we not look at sustainability as just a 
side thing, but include it in operation, we're going to start seeing the innovation that comes out by stacking the environment and the social issues and find the economics that can out of it. And I hope this is something we discuss at the UN General Assembly next week. Yeah, um, earlier in the year, somebody said to me, how can you, are you still focused on ESG? Because how, I mean, how can you possibly have time to focus on it? Look at all the things going on in the world, you know, inflation and interest rates. And, and this is the beginning of, of the Ukraine-Russia conflict. And I said, well, or China, right? There were rising numbers of COVID again. I said, but, but all those things are ESG things. So the acronym has become a bit challenged, potentially. Maybe a little bit of a poison chalice. I think we have to look underneath the acronym at the things that we're actually concerned about. But I think what's really important to remember is that um, this is not the last of the, the dislocations. There will be something else next year and the year after that. Yeah. And so uh, what you want to build is something that is robust, investment opportunity, right, where you have you see your mission clearly, you know why you're doing this. So people can ride out these these challenges, right? Um, it has to it has to maintain consistency. And for that, people have to understand why they're doing something for the long term. Again, be able to sort of live out the, um, the cycles. Thank you, Wayne. Ram, last words. Last words. This, this, is a, uh, this is a marathon, not a sprint. And I guess I, I will echo some of the comments made by Chantelina and Marina saying this, you know, we see it from our clients. We see it from our employees. We see it from regulators and our board. There, there's tremendous momentum behind this. I, I'll, I'll leave you with this last thought is this is a generational problem. And I take some solace in the fact that I look at my own kids and they're, um, you know, they're, how much they're tuned to this, even at a young age. I certainly, when I was growing up, this was not on my um, top of mind. It, it, it's changing. So this is going to be, um, I do think there's a positive momentum behind this uh, structurally, even though we might have some of these waves. And that's encouraging because we only have one planet. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you.